Richards. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth in this series. Uh, this is our, un our underwater heritage uh, presentation series. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Outer Banks Community Foundation. They provided the support to get these scholars out here to talk about their recent research. Uh, I'd like to thank the Coastal Studies Institute for uh, providing the venue. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank our partners in this uh, initiative, uh, the uh, Graveyard Atlantic Museum in Hatteras. Uh, for those of you that didn't know, every time we have one of these presentations, there's also an 11 o'clock presentation down in Hatteras. So this is the second go for uh, Ryan today. Uh, I'd, I'd also like to thank the program in Maritime Studies at East Carolina University. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have some people watching online, uh, some people up in Corolla Library in particular. Uh, welcome online. Um, Ryan's talk today is actually about the whaling industry in North Carolina. Uh, those of you might have seen um, a previous presentation that uh, Ryan gave earlier, earlier in his research in September. Uh, subtly, uh, with a subtle change, uh, he, his presentation was called Where Are the Whalers? Um, tonight he's going to be talking about Where Were the Whalers, an archaeology of uh, whaling in North Carolina. Um, if, if I could just ask you all to close off your uh, cell phones before we start. And also, we'll, we'll keep the uh, questions until the end so that we can pass around the microphone and uh, have other people online ask questions. Ryan? Sure. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, and we'll get, we'll get right started. So I'm talking about the history and archaeology of whaling in North Carolina, but we're going to actually start in the 20th century. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, right, right in the first couple of decades, whaling was winding down, especially here in North Carolina. Um, petroleum was all, you know, had come into vogue. Um, they didn't need the whale oil as much, and, and people started realizing that they were a finite resource and that they were starting to go away. So the services of whalers in North Carolina kind of transitioned, and um, one of the interesting things is that there was an individual in Virginia that got hired by the Smithsonian to acquire a, a, a giant manta ray. Um, these were called devil fish at the time. And this individual wanted to pursue these. They're, they're found off of the southern waters and sometimes in the Gulf Coast, and he needed a hardy crew to do it. So where did he come but North Carolina? And it just so happens that there was a certain individual that wanted to join them, had heard about this type of hunt, and uh, when they assembled the crew, if you take a look in the picture in the left-hand corner, you might recognize who that individual is. It's Teddy Roosevelt. So just to give you an idea of the pedigree of the individuals that North Carolina whalers were, uh, the, Teddy Roosevelt learned how to throw an iron by working with these guys. There's Teddy with an iron. It's one of my favorite photos. So um, by way of introduction, I would talk about first the history of whaling in North America um, and North America, North American Atlantic side. Um, and then it's going to transition into history of whaling in North Carolina. I'm going to talk about my research design, uh, uh, how I pursued the research, and then the results of the research, and then uh, interpretations. So first, we're going to actually go back 500 years ago, 600 years ago. We're over in Europe, and we're looking at um, Europe right now. We've got Spain down to the left and France, and in between is an area um, that was occupied by a, gr a group called the Basques. And the Basques went hunting in the Bay of Biscay, which is this bay right here. If I can get that right in here. And whales frequented this area. And the Basque had been hunting them from um, about the, the year 1000 AD, um, and probably earlier, but that's when historical records start indicating that they're hunting there. And it's uh, actually um, be because they were able to use uh, the whale products, they actually sold the meat um, in markets in Europe because of, of um, holidays, religious holidays, like we have tomorrow with Good Friday, where Catholics weren't allowed to eat meat, but if you sold whale meat, it was technically a fish, so it was a, a way to circumnavigate that. But there was also other uses of whale, um, in particular the baleen, and I'll get into that more later. Um, but it could be turned into oil, and oil was used for lighting and other resources. So here's a, a nice depiction from the 16th century showing the bass at work. Um, this is an, uh, an artist's interpretation of what a whale looked like. They, uh, this obviously was an individual that had joined the hunt. But you get an idea that they're using a harpoon. The harpoon's got some kind of rope on it. And you can't really tell if the rope is attached to the boat. And that's going to be something we're going to talk about um, a little later on. So what happens, and this is a general theme that occurs with whaling, is that you tend to either use up all the whale stocks or the whales get smart and they go away. And they don't frequent your waters anymore. So the bass had to spread out and they, they went north to areas of Greenland. 
and even made it all the way over to North America where they set up a, um, a summer retreat where that's all they did. They, they, they set up in Red Bay and during the summers they would hunt the whales from shore. So they would set up lookouts on shore and pursue them in these small boats that are about 20 size, 26 feet long. Um, there'd be uh, one guy in the front with a harpoon and what what indica indications we have right now is that they use what was called a drogue. So what they did is when they threw the harpoon, on the end of it was a, a wooden block or some kind of float so that when they threw it, it would impede the progress of the whale. Um, so what they, they set up these seasonal, they, they would set up on shore, they would have a lookout that went, looked out to sea. The men would kind of set up a base camp and kind of work on uh, making their accommodations for the season. If a whale was sighted, a call went out, they took to the boats and pursued the whales. Excuse me. Now the main um, whale that they were going for in the North, uh, North American Atlantic was the, called the right whale. And it's referred to the right whale according to um, different sources, that it was really the right whale to go, to go after. There was different whales that were available, but some were faster. This is notoriously slow and sluggish. Um, sometimes when you killed other whales, they sank. So this whale floated. So it, there had a, a lot of these wonderful attributes. It was full of blubber, and then it had this mouth full of baleen. Now, right whales are what are called filter feeders, and they open their mouth and swim along through the water, and allowing for small cr crustaceans and other um, zooplankton to get in, and then they use their massive tongue, push out the water, um, leaving the food in that they then swallow. Well, this baleen was kind of like a, uh, um, a keratin, like kind of like your fingernails, and if you steamed it and then put it into a shape and let it dry, it would hold that shape. So um, they ended up it was kind of an ad, uh, a use of something similar to plastics are used today. So it was highly valued. So what we were, ab we were able to know as much about the bass whalers in North America is because we actually found archaeological remains. Um, Parks Canada led this amazing recovery um, in the in area of Red Bay after um, this woman historian did a, an amazing job of tracking down these documents that kept referring to areas in Labrador and in Red Bay. And they were able to recover um, a whole whale, uh, whale boat. This is an example of what one of the whale boats were. This was brought up piece by piece. It was preserved and it was reassembled. Um, here's an example of the Basque harpoon. Looks very similar to um, probably your idea of what a harpoon is. And this is the large vessels that they would use to go from, to come from their country over to Labrador. Um, but they were pursuing the whales in these boats. So now we're moving into uh, the new world. The, now that um, uh, England is starting to be beginning to settle New England, uh, English are arriving. Um, the, the whaling industry was actually something that in induced individuals to move to America. Uh, when the Mayflower landed, one of the things that encouraged the individuals there was that there were so many whales there. That was something that it actually excited them, that we can make money, that's floating money out there. Um, so that was an encouragement at Plymouth Rock. But the whaling industry didn't begin there, it, in a sense, as far as a whaling industry, it actually began in Long Island. And it wasn't a sense that they went and pursued the whales themselves. These were drift whales. These were whales that naturally beached um, or sick or whatever. Um, and these individuals, there was a lot of infighting because whales were worth money. So these communities um, in Long Island said, listen, let's work together. Everyone can profit from this. And that was the beginning of an established idea of an industry. Um, th similar things took place along uh, the New England area. And eventually, it wasn't enough waiting for whales to wash up. That, that they just couldn't wait around. And people got ambitious. And they learned, um, and many say that it's the Basque traits, because the Basque went on to teach the Dutch, went on to teach the uh, English, and then the traits finally trickled down to the New World. So they did similar things and set up um, shore whaling on different sites throughout New England. Um, one of the places in particular, Nantucket, there's this uh, wonderful letter that is from right before the revolution and, and it details the methods in which they pursued whales, where again, they set up a mast-like structure on the shore, they looked out to sea, and when they saw that a, a flume that came up from these whales that could go up to 12 feet, uh, they would call out, guys would hop in the boats, pursue the whale, harpoon it, same thing, as far as they're concerned, they were using a drogue, um, the drogue would slow it, and then they would, after it tired, then they would get up close enough to then kill it by using uh, a spear or a lance. So this developed, and again, um, just like we've talked about before, um, 
the whale stop coming around. There's not as many. They start depleting um, the whale stocks. So they have to go farther abroad. And now they're, they're not using the 26-footers anymore. Now they're, they're moving into the larger boats, like 80-footers. Um, there's, there's sloops. Uh, there's, there's, uh, the, the, there allows them to stay at sea for longer periods of time, up to a couple weeks. And they would bring one or two of the smaller boats with them. They would catch the whale, they'd bring it upside the boat, and then they would strip the whale of its blubber, and then put the blubber in casks so that they could then return to places like Nantucket or other areas in New England, and then you'd have to render it down. And to render whale oils, you need these large iron pots, you put it in the pots, you start a fire, and it, it, and it draws out the oil um, so that now you've got the, the oil that you can then, is the marketable good. So um, thanks, thanks to these developments, thanks to going farther abroad, New Englanders um, kept going farther abroad to find uh, right whales, and Eventually, it led them to North Carolina. So we, what we see in the 17th century, in 1666, Peter Carteret, and that name should sound familiar to any individual um, who's maybe from the southern um, outer banks of North Carolina, Carteret County. Um, he was the assistant governor. It, we find in the historical documents that he, he did um, provide a license to New Englanders to come down and whale because they did have to put in the shore to try out the oil. Uh, at this time, they still relied on coming into shore to try it out. Um, by 1725, Samuel Chadwick um, attains a license to whale. See, these are the only elements that we're finding in the historical record. We don't know how successful they are. We don't know how San Samuel was faring. We just know that he did show up and try to do it. In 1733, Edward Mosley draws this map. Now, Mosley's a smart guy, and he works for um, the government. And what he wants is North Carolina to get some, get some more um, encouragement for people to come and move there. And one of the ways to do it, just like uh, the people in Plymouth, was to show that there are whales in the water. That's a marketable good. If there are whales in the water, then that's an opportunity for people to make money. So he knew that. This is what I suppose. He knew that, and he included it. Look at there's whales offshore. North Carolina is great. We've got whales. We can make money. So uh, right around this time, 1733, there's, there's these new developments that are occurring in the whaling that's happening in New England. They're, they're going abroad, and what they do is they end up encountering a new type of whale. This is called the sperm whale. Now, a sperm whale was actually smaller than the right whale, but it had a, a different kind of oil. And this oil was a, a pure, superior oil than the right whale. So with going after this new quarry, this new type of whale, some of the methods in which they were going after it were ch changed. And how they went about the business of going after whales changed. Meanwhile, the introduction into North Carolina was still that colonial, that, that, the right whale, the pursuit. Um, there's, a couple, there's a couple different stories. One of them is a, 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 um, a apocryphal story about uh, an individual who saw these whales, was kind of shocked, that had never seen them, and killed a couple and brought them in. And that was the introduction to the whaling of sperm whales because of, of its uh, superior quality. Oil. Now, the development that was most crucial was that they started attaching their boat directly to the whale. So sperm whales, they threw the harpoon, the harpoon was attached to their boat, so their boat became the huge float that was behind the whale. Um, so now you're putting the, the life of your crew <laughs> at danger, and with a much more vicious um, animal as well. But the profits were that, that high, and the individuals behind it were, that felt strongly about it. So now in North Carolina, we're, again, we're looking at scant um, historical documents. And we look at prior to the Revolution, um, we're looking at the coast of North Carolina right here. And what we find is that there was, there's a few sources that say New Englanders would use, this is Cape Lookout, and this is the bite of Cape Lookout. Now, they would come in here and kind of anchor, because it was a nice, safe place to harbor. And then from there, they would go after whales. Um, a, a, a few minor, this is prior to the Revolution, um, the colonial time period. Between 1750 and the Civil War, well, there's very, very little. There's not much information. We've got a few things that there was this Frenchman that was off the shore, and while, while he was going by, he noticed these strange um, kind of grass huts that were on near Cape Lookout, and he knew they were whalers, and there, there, were, there was a conversation about them being whaler huts. It was a seasonal activity. When, when whaling in North Carolina occurred um, from January into about the first of May, that was the time when the right whales were making a migratory route north. So that was the time period in which they're there. Um, we do have records out of Beaufort that indicate that there's a porpoise fishery. Um, and it's, this is an interesting thing that I found out during the research is that they misnamed um, porpoise. They were actually going after a bottlenose dolphin. 
but the fishermen did pursue a dolphin, which is a type of fish, so there was some kind of changeover where they started calling them um, porpoise instead of dolphin. So that was an interesting to thing to find out. But in addition to going after the dolphins, they did get an occasional whale. So every now and then they got one. Now, um, it's kind of hard to see, but Marmaduke Royal, great name. Um, estate records include, he, so Marmaduke Royal uh, had, we, where we find a historical document that says his estate records indicate that he had whaling implements and he lived on Shackleford Banks. I mean, again, we're not, there's, not, there's not a whole story here. There's not notes that people wrote or letters or extensive information. Just find a census record that says, you know, this guy died and he got rid of some whale craft. That's the only indication that we have that whaling was occurring. Um, moving on. So it wasn't until after the Civil War, according to historical documents, that scientists who happen to be in the area are making note. Now we're getting some literature where they're, they're, they're observing the whales, the whalers, and, and taking note of how they pursued it. Um, the guy on the left here is Elliot Cowes, and he was stationed at Fort Macon, which is just south of Shackleford Banks. And while he was there, he took an interest. He, he even took a boat over to, to go check out the whale and, and kind of talk to the guys there. W.C. Kerr was employed by um, the government as well. He was a geologist, and he was uh, through going through the area recording. And it, one of the things he wrote in his notes, he was so surprised to find out that a single whale could fetch between $1,200 and $1,500 dollars that th at that time, which is like the 1870s, which is equivalent to about twenty-five to 30000 today. So in a day's work, they could go out and get a whale. It did take them longer than a day to process it, but these individuals could um, put together um, some cash. So finally, uh, in 1880, we, the U.S. government decides that we need to take stock of the fisheries throughout the entire U.S. So they send an individual to different parts, in Florida, um, in the West Coast, and, and all these different areas, and, and one of them came to North Carolina, and that's where we finally get an in-depth description on how whalers pursued it here in North Carolina. And it reads very similar to some of the accounts that came out of New England in the colonial period. They had an individual that sat on, on a high point, either a high sand dune, sometimes in trees, um, and, and just surveyed the horizon. Again, we're talking about from February to May. So we're talking about chilly weather, chilly conditions, not necessarily the most hospitable time period. Um, they'd look out there and would, again, give the call. When a whale was sighted, they would take to the boats, go out, they would throw the harpoon, harpoon was attached to a drogue, and in this account, we hear for the first time, which is a technological development that occurred to pelagic whalers, which were the deep sea whalers, and this was a bomb gun, and it was essentially a grenade launcher for your shoulder, and you shot an arrow full of black powder into the whale to kill it quicker. So in this account, we know that North Carolina whalers by 1880 are using this new technology. So Although some of their methods may seem archaic, they would still have this uh, access to, to new technology. So, for my research design, I'm trying to plug some of these holes. There's a lot of, there's, there's information missing in the historical record. The idea of archaeologists is that we look at material things and hopefully um, they, they'll tell us more. Maybe they line up with the historical documents. Um, and, and maybe they can answer some questions that, that we have. So one of them, first thing I have to do is I have to comb the, the archives. There were individuals that did research uh, whaling in North Carolina. So I needed to kind of make, see what they did, kind of check out where they went, uh, see what sources they used, and then see if there was anything new that I could find. The next step I had to do was I, I, I wanted to look at material culture that still remains in North Carolina today. And I know that there were some in museums. There's, there were some located in the Natural Science Museum in Raleigh. There's some located in Beaufort uh, um, at the museum, the Maritime Museum there. And then there was actually some located at the um, Core Sound Water, Wild, yeah, <laughs> Core Sound uh, Wild Fowl Museum. And that's in Harkers Island, which is again, real close to Shackleford Banks. So once I, I, I've kind of located that there are some le uh, left in um, North Carolina, I also wanted to appeal to the public. Let's see if maybe some individuals out there um, know or have any material culture left. Maybe it was passed on from a grandparent, maybe it's been in the family. So I needed to appeal to individuals in the communities on the Outer Banks and find out if they maybe knew some information. And when I, when I had the opportunity to work with them, uh, I would record oral histories, get what they could tell me about um, what they remember hearing from their grandparents or whatever family stories that might survive. So here were some of my research questions. There's, there's a lot here. But what, what, I was, what I'm trying to get at is, is especially 
where, if I was able to find individuals that have artifacts and they're located, depending upon where those artifacts are located, can that tell us something new about North Carolina whaling? If they're, they're located in different locations that goes against the historical record, what does that say about maybe we don't have the history but the objects could tell us something different? Um, one of the things that was a good question is also, all, we always heard that whaling occurred down by Cape Lookout. Well, I've talked to naturalists and I know that whales frequent the entire coast of North Carolina. Whales that, are, that wash up of, of different species. So why did the whalers want to only congregate to the south? That was a question that maybe we thought material culture could answer. Um, by looking at objects that are left over, by looking at the artifacts, can that tell us something about the relationship they have with other individuals um, whether it was through trade or, or did they make their own artifact or make their own implements that they use for whaling. Um, could, there, could we compare how whaling uh, occurred on shore here in North Carolina to other communities? There was community, um, communities in different areas of the world, in particular California, that was shore-based. Uh, did they share similar um, tactics and, and modes? And then can material culture, can these artifacts point to possibly new places that we could find artifacts. Maybe they're buried somewhere. Like maybe there's an untold story of them being in a river because that's where they went, you know, when, when they were done whaling for the season. So the first place I went to was the Natural Science Museum, which is located in um, Raleigh, North Carolina. And there was this fabulous individual named H.H. H. Brimley. And Brimley was an interesting guy because one of the things is that, first of all, he was British. So he moved here later, but became a citizen and really took an interest in North Carolina. And eventually really became interested in whaling in North Carolina. Um, being one of the first curators at the museum, he took it upon himself to go to Shackelford Banks. He was uh, able to secure the first, uh, he actually secured the skeleton to a right whale and brought it back to Raleigh and it's still on display today. So if you have an opportunity to go to Raleigh, you look up, you see a right whale skeleton. That is one that the whalers of Outer Banks of North Carolina got for the curator of the Natural Science Museum. In 1894, um, pr actually prior to 1894, he had visited and, and borrowed a few of the implements because he thought it was so interesting. He wanted to share this North Carolina whaling story to other individuals. And at, this, at, at that time, there was these fabulous world fairs. And in 1894, no, it was, yeah, 1894, he, sh he went back and secured a number of artifacts that he wanted to display at uh, the World Fair. The World Fair did not <laughs> occur until 1903, it was in St. Louis. And that's what this is here. This is the, uh, the North Carolina display, and it's kind of hard to see with the light, but here are whaling implements that are on display. Um, and it ended up winning them an award. The people were so fascinated about it and didn't know that whaling occurred in uh, North Carolina, of all places. So the next place I went to was the uh, North Carolina uh, Maritime Museum in Beaufort. And here's an example of some of the objects that were on display um, for, for the purposes of my thesis. I uh, isolated them and created on a white background. And then I went to the Core Sound Waterfowl Museum um, and was able to find some implements there. They had, uh, th it's a very nice communal um, where there's donations that occur and they have nice oral histories. And then finally, private collections. Uh, what I did, and, and some of you might have caught it, is I, I set up a series of talks that occurred in different parts of the Outer Banks. And I started in Kerala, and I, I, I had one here, and I had one in Hatteras, and then I had one in Beaufort. So I kind of got the whole um, Outer Banks and tried to encourage individuals that could share any uh, artifacts, um, implements, or oral histories. And I was able to turn up a few. I talked to some individuals that were willing to share their stories. Um, and, and talk about them and let me photograph them. So one of the other things I had was photographic evidence uh, that I used because sometimes the objects just are no longer here. Uh, again, this, this photo is a little grainy, but you've got, I zoomed in on that St. Louis exhibit and here are some artifacts, some harpoons. Uh, here's a giant lance. And then this photograph is from 1943. It's actually the last remaining whale boat used uh, in, on the North Carolina coast. Uh, another thing that I relied on were illustrations. When Brimley came back from his experience on Outer Banks, he uh, had brought an illustrator, and his illustrator and him worked together to create uh, renditions of what occurred in North Carolina when, when they brought a whale to shore. So here it is, they bring the whale to shore. They relied on the tide to bring the whale up to the highest point on the beach, and then when the tide receded, it was left high and dry, and then they would anchor the whale to the shore, and then they could, the men could get to work. And the men use these large spades, and again, it's kind of hard to see, to chop away the, the blubber, and then they would 
put it, put a hole through it, and stick a, a pole through it to then cart it off to the triworks where they could then render it. Um, sometimes the triworks were up to a quarter mile away. And this is what the triworks look like. So you've got this um, brickwork, you've got two iron pots, you've got a fire underneath, and here the guys, they're, they're mincing it, they're chopping it up and it's making it into smaller bits, again more smaller bits, to put it in to the pots to render it into oil. So, what turned up from the research? I split up the objects into two separate uh, categories because there, there were indications that the objects used in pursuit, pursuit was going after the whale. Um, there was indications that those were a different set compared to the objects used on shore. Um, and there was indications about the uniqueness of these two separate groups. So we'll start first with pursuit. And what we, we see are these great harpoons. Um, this is a two flute or double flute harpoon. Uh, it, it's again, it's very similar to that Basque whaling one that we saw earlier. And it's, what was wonderful about this one is that not only um, did it have a maker's mark right here, that I was able to associate with uh, a brother team located in New Bedford. And the brothers joined up for this, uh, for their blacksmithing. And, the, and once they joined up, the one brother passed away. So we know that these two were only a team for basically a one to two year period. So I was able to accurately date this to about this one to two year time period, about 1856, 1857. Um, this is a iron shank with a steel head. Um, so you have this great maker's mark, and then I had this one, the wonderful documents that went along with it. When Brimley went to, uh, to acquire these, to, to get these implements, he talked to the captain there named Johnny Lewis. And what, what Brimley kind of recognized even then in 1894 was that what, was, what made it interesting is that they had stories behind these implements. The North Carolina whalers even had irons that they called lucky irons. And he wanted the stories behind them too. So uh, Lewis is like, well, I mean, there's not, I mean, there's stories. I can tell you stories. The one thing that I do know is that this one has been in 14 whales. So they, they actually knew how many whales that the harpoon had been in. Now, if you were to talk to a Plogic whaler, if you um, were to meet one of those individuals, they worked for companies. It was very industrialized. The first harpoon you threw into a whale was a brand new one. You would never, the second harpoon might, might have been used. And the main thing was that when you threw a harpoon into a whale, the whale thrashed around, it was very strong, and it, it could bend and, and contort that implement, that iron, and then uh, eff effectively weakening it, weakening it. And so when it came to these industrial whalers, that was, not some, that was a concern. They didn't want a weakened harpoon. In North Carolina, they unbent it, straightened it out, used some tools to put it back together, and then they passed it on. There's indications that they passed it on to the next generation. So when you're throwing a harpoon and you're on a pelagic boat, you're throwing someone else's harpoon. You're throwing the, the ship owner back in New Bedford, back in New England's harpoon. It's not your harpoon. But in North Carolina, you're throwing possibly your father's, the same one that he got whales. And that's also true of this one here. This is called an improved toggle. And Th that's what's a, another great indicator about these two, is that the, this, it, this is from the colonial period. It, it's, not, it's not dated to that, but that design, the, the, the double, dual flute, it, it is a design that had been around since the Basque. And it, was, it wasn't until the 19th century that they started improving upon these type of implements. So what they did is they, they went for, with a single flute, they kind of tried that out, and that kind of worked better too. Uh, one of the sources that I'd read, when you threw a harpoon in, one out of seven whales were kept because that's sometimes the harpoon just came out. So right around 1840s, there was a blacksmith, an African-American living in New Bedford, um, had developed a new iron, and it's called, it called it the temple toggle. And this is a, a, a modification of the temple toggle. But what this did is that it had a matchstick. And you can see this is actually a piece of rope, but the matchstick went through that. And when it penetrated into the blubber, and then it was it, when there was felt like a, a, a backwards pressure, the toggle opened, like here. So you got this up, it's going up and down, and then now that, that backward, it's now wide open, so you got more surface area, so it's securing to the whale um, more uh, efficiently. So you've got this great example of the old school technology, and then you got the new developed technology. This also has a maker's mark on it, Macy. Macy is a uh, family that had originally started in Nantucket, eventually moved to New Bedford. Um, some of you might be familiar with the name Macy as the department store. That is the direct line of the family of whalers, um, a direct relationship. 
They started the store, um, if you notice on Macy's, that's, there's a white star. That white star was a whaling signal. It was a signal used for the Macy ships. Um, so you have the temple toggle here. Again, we got a great indication that we have both. This one, I, this, so this one was in 14 whales, this was in twice as many, which is another indication that uh, this one was more efficient, so they used it more often, possibly. So now here we have a boat spade, and a boat spade, these are objects, again, used in the pursuit. The boat spade was kept in the boat and could be used for two different, really two different uh, opportunities. One of them was that when the whale just wouldn't give up, and this was kind of tricky, and this was, people attri attributed this to earlier in the whaling era, they would go up and actually try to, try to get at its tail and kind of hack at its tail, that way it couldn't continue to flee. So try to cut the tendons at the tail, and that's generally what you'd use this for. But in addition, you would use this to put a hole in the whale somewhere in the flukes, in its tail, to then attach the rope to your boat to then tow it in. So you needed this to put a hole in the whale so you could bring it back to shore. Um, what's interesting about this boat spade is that it, this is iron and then just the edge is steel. Steel holds its sharpness much longer and much better. And when you're hacking at a, a blubber or you, sometimes you're gonna hit bone, you need that to be sharp. But you, you also need it to be strong. What we know from manufacturers of whale craft is that they stopped making these out of iron right around, uh, right prior to the Civil War. So right around the Civil War, they stopped making them out of iron, they made them completely out of steel. So I was able to effectively date this to prior to the Civil War. Lewis tells us that this was 75 years old in 1903. So we're going back to the 1840s, 1830s. We have some lances. So now that you've, the whale is tired and you got up close to it, you're going to use this lance, which is our extremely long. We're talking about six feet and up because you're in the boat. So that you got waves, they're down in the water and you want to go through the blubber and try to get to the vitals. So you need a very long implement to get down in there. Um, again, these were iron and then the steel would be, uh, the head would be steel. So you can sharpen that and remain its uh, maintain its sharpness as well. Uh, both of these had been in upwards, one was 46 whales it had killed. So we're talking again, an oral history, because it may have been written, it may have been documented somewhere, but those documents are lost. This individual knew how many whales these had been in, and it could have been an oral history. It could have been a point of pride that they shared. When, when they handed that to their son, said, son, this is now yours. It's been in 24, you gotta up me. You know, they could be one of those. Um, so it was, you know, they had this information. And the next is the bomb gun. So the bomb gun was developed te technologically, it came around, right around uh, 1840s, wh where the patent shows up, but it didn't really come into prominence yet. Whalers are notoriously uh, immune to new technology. They're kind of fickle. They don't, the old tried and true method works, so they don't, you know, don't give me something new. But when they started finding out that you could use this, th oh, this bomb gun, what happened? Okay, sorry. You could use this bomb gun and it would shoot these lances, these explosive cartridges into the whale and, and kill it at a, at a better or a more efficient rate. And it's also, it's somewhat safer. You could be at a little bit of a distance from the whale instead of getting up real close to it with the lance. So each one of these are examples that this was in the Raleigh Museum, it no longer is. Unfortunately, it was lost in this place, we don't know. Um, this is an example of, uh, I was able to find an individual describe the maker and the variety of lance that went in it. This is the model that I was able to find based on the dimensions that he told me. And then th this is in the property of a current um, North Carolina resident. He takes it down off his mantle every year and polishes the brass fittings. He remembers as a child actually playing with it in the yard. The other thing that's unique about whaling in North Carolina, we talked about how in colonial days they would use what's called a drogue. The toughest thing about when you want to study something called the drogue is that depending upon who's writing about it, they're going to spell it differently. So I came across a drag, a drug, a drogue, a, a drudge, but they're all referring to the same kind of principle. Um, this object here is an example of a uh, indigenous Arctic uh, drogue. This is actually a dried out and cured seal skin and it was uh, inflated and allowed to float. And the interesting thing about the indigenous is that really they taught a lot of the methods to uh, the, the Western and eventually the, 
the, the individuals in New England who made iron. The, not only did the drogue idea probably come from them, most definitely the toggle iron came from them. They used, a, to their technology, they used a bone toggle, but they still it developed the toggle technology. The difference between pelagic whalers and shore whalers is that pelagic whalers would use something like this as a drogue. This is uh, actually like a little barrel. It's not very big, um, but it would, it would essentially act it's the same way, where it's kind of a parachute. Drogues is a word for, for parachutes that slow things down. It's used when, uh, when you're talking about also there's sea anchors too. When a ship is going off course or it needs to bring its bow around, they would throw this over the side and you could really you know, bring your boat back in a line. And then this is an example of the North Carolina one. And this one, it, it, if you read Moby Dick and if you go to the chapter that talks about a drogue, it sounds like he's talking about this. It, it's a plank, it's double plank, so you can see there's some going horizontal while the others are, sorry, some are going vertical while the others are going horizontal and you've got two layers. And then you've got this middle piece going in the center. So this, this part would be attached to the harpoon. This might have a line attached to another drogue. So you could have a series of drogues behind it to help slow it down. If you can, it's hard to see, but it says J-E-L there for John E. Lewis. Um, going back hundreds of years, the best way, if you're, going, if you're hunting whales, the, sometimes you didn't catch the whale, but you would, you would signature your implement. You would in, write in it, inscribe in it, so that in, in the case, if that whale did eventually die, two days later, a day later, and it washed up, you essentially had claimed that whale as yours because you had initialed your implement. So uh, in North Carolina, instead of the harpoon, they initialed the drogue. So if they pursued it, and they pursued it all day, and they got exhausted, and they went home, and it washed up two days later, John E. Lewis had uh, control of that, those, that whale. Now we're gonna move into processing. Now they're on shore. Here are some of the objects that we were able to find. Uh, so the, the, the whale is beached up. They would have to cut into the blubber. They'd have to put it on the pole, and they'd have to walk it back to the triworks. Here's an example of a tripod found in the Maritime Museum in Beaufort. And what's interesting when you compare pelagic whalers and shore whalers is the, the size. The, we're not on an industrial scale in North Carolina. So no, it makes sense that the implements are industrial. This, this only fits about 75 gallons. Um, the pelagic whalers would have uh, much larger, up to 200 gallons were some of the size, and they would have two of them. And they were often also would have one flat face or two flat faces so that they could be butted up right next to each other. You're on a ship, so you want to save space. Um, this one was entirely round. There's a great possibility because of some of the things that we learn about whaling is that this was maybe something that used to do the laundry when it wasn't that time of the year to do whaling. There's a possibility that these were repurposed implements. And that's what we look over here. We, this is a, a kind of recognizable machete or a cane knife. We do know that uh, pelagic whalers, there was a subset that came out of Providence Town um, that in Massachusetts that, that did this circuitous route that took them down to the uh, West Indies. And the West Indies, especially in the 19th century, with the sugar industry, these were very popular. So it's a possibility that there was some kind of trade between the pelagic whalers and these uh, sugar cane. <laughs> and then the, the Providence Town whalers often would stop by uh, North Carolina. And that's what the, the, this, these sort of Im implements indicate is that these whalers would stop by the area, try to get some whales, but if not, they ended up exchanging some of the technology with North Carolina whalers. That's what I suppose, or that's what historians also think, is that there was this, this transfer of information and goods between the pelagic whalers and the North Carolina whalers because the North Carolina whalers did pick up some of this new technology. Up here we have a, a blubber hook that we think may be a blubber, blubber hook. It turned up in the museum in um, Raleigh. And here is a, this is an example of a spade. This was brought into the Core Sound um, Waterfowl Museum. And this is interesting too because again, we talked about earlier where you need a steel edge that maintains its sharpness. This is completely of iron. Um, and and it, it doesn't look like any other spade I've seen, although a lot of the blubber spades had different um, shapes. At the end of the day, you need, to cut, you need to cut blubber, it needs to be sharp and it needs to be thin. This was extremely thin. It even shows use that you might, have, you might have hit some whalebone at the top there. You know, it kind of brought it in. When I compared this to other objects, it, it, it looked something similar to like a peat 
um, a pea implement that was used to cut pea or grass and in, in used in gardening or used in agriculture. So it had like a sh similar design. It's possible that the whalers saw these other implements and maybe used them at other time of the year, but when whaling season came around, you know, go get that out of the shed, we need to go chop up this whale. So the, during the hunt, during the search, I did come across objects that might have been whaling. Um, I wasn't able to confirm it. I was able to confirm that some were not. Here's an example of a uh, counterfeit lance or a, a reproduction. It was used to, it was an, it's an older model, certainly, and here's a, um, a harpoon that goes with it. They are older, but there are, there's just a number of characteristics that set it apart from being a legitimate uh, harpoon object or a legitimate whale craft. For example, this is made of a, a copper alloy, a bronze. This was not something that was whalers would um, prefer when you're, you're talking about lances and harpoons. You also have this kind of very decorative wood. It's got, it got the octagonal shape to it. Whalers would use a, a wood that was roughly hewn. It was uncut and, and to get that good grip when you want to launch these. So you're not, you're not going to have this nice kind of fancy kind of smooth uh, looking wood on it. Um, and then you've got objects like this one. This one may very well have been used to, ch to chop into blubber. It's, it's got a very thin handle. It, it looks like something out of the medieval uh, time period, but it's got a very sharp steel blade. It is steel, and it has this kind of grip um, on it. So I, I couldn't, when I compare it to other um, known whaling implements, I couldn't say for sure. This, also comparing it to other implements, I wasn't able to confirm whether it was whaling or not. It did look like a brush knife used, again, in agriculture, used in, in, um, in the outdoors. And then th this one was great just to, to bring in was Marmaduke Royal was one of the few um, that turned up in the historical record that had anything to do with whaling. Well, this guy still had Marmaduke Royal's chest. This is his chest, it's from 1790, and in it he keeps a whaling implement that was passed on down to him. So it's, th it's something that he values uh, as the heritage that he comes from. So what? What do, we, what, do we, what do we know now? What do we learn from this? So based on where the artifacts are, um, can we learn something new about the industry? So does it change our perception? So going out and talking to individuals, and then I would map where I met them, where I talked to them, did that change what we knew about whaling in North Carolina? And why, also, could we answer the question, why did they only decide to go to this one area to go whaling? This is a map that shows what we know historically. Historically, uh, individuals who were in the area, the scientists, the passerbys, made note that whaling generally occurred from Cape Hatteras, here, so we're looking at the coast of North Carolina here. You got Hatteras and then Cape Lookout right into the inlet there by Beaufort. That's what the historical documents tell us. So what do the artifacts tell us? Well, all the artifacts came in this area of Cape Lookout. We know that in Shackleford Banks, there was a whaling community there. We know that a storm, uh, a major hurricane or a series of hurricanes came through at the end of the century and displaced the individuals that lived there. And those individuals moved to Harker's Island, Beaufort, and Moorhead City. So the artifacts show the trajectory of the people that once lived on Shackleford Banks. This outlier, I had a, I had a young man at my talk this morning who was just like, what are the artifacts doing way out there? Well, that's the, that's the Natural Science Museum in Raleigh, and that's, um, you know, Brimley made a point to go out there in, you know, a much larger population and let the rest of North Carolina know that whaling occurred in North Carolina. So, can material culture remains tell us about the relationship between the shore base and the pelagic? Is there a relationship? During my research, one of the interesting things that I came across is that a couple different um, sources said, in 1874, this one particular vessel called Daniel Webster came and introduced the whaling gun to North Carolina. And it was, it was really one individual said, and said it, and then I feel others kind of took it and went with it, and it was like, this is, you know, this, there's, this is the only indication that we have. It was very specific. While I was in the uh, archives in, um, at ECU, uh, working with a, a friend of mine, she actually turned me on to that there was whaling, there was these letters that referenced whaling. She didn't really know what it was, so I went and, you know, you had to go through them, and it wasn't exactly organized, and the, the script is from uh, the 1860s. It's just after the Civil War, and there's this correspondence. It, it's their love letters. But it was interesting because the guy who's stationed in Beaufort is telling his love about um, the whaling that's occurring in Beaufort. And one of the things he brings up is that the whalers nowadays use a, an explosive gun, a shoulder gun. This is, this is 1867, which it predates it by eight years to when the Webster 
supposedly introduced it. Now, this record doesn't indicate that the it doesn't indicate that the whalers in North Carolina took on the, to the new technology, but at least the whalers in North Carolina were aware of the technology prior to uh, 1876. So North Carolina shore-based communities and other whaling communities, I, there I would have liked to spend more time on this. I, I, you know, with a thesis, you've got a short period of time to try to get as much information as you can. There was communities uh, in Carmel, California, and it, it was the same, it was a similar in that they only were relied on shore base, they relied on whales that were only seasonal, but they were predominantly um, from, they were predominantly Portuguese from the um, Cape Verde, Verde Islands, and, but it, again, they had a very industrial approach. They were, it was, it, there wasn't the wait for the tide to bring up the whale. It was, they had winches and they had, they had all kinds of different gear to access and, and they kept very good records of tons, the um, large amounts of oil that came up. So when we talk about the pursuit versus processing and how the differences kind of uh, show up in the archeological record, um, the, what, like I had mentioned before with the drogue, is that it, it harkens back to that colonial period when they, when they used the drogue, when um, they, they didn't tie directly to the whale. And the biggest thing is the, the reuse, the fact that some of these implements had been reused again and again and been passed down and that they kept track. It wasn't, you know, it was, it was important to them to know how many times they had, it had been in a whale. Um, then there's processing objects. They, what we kind of looked at is when we talk about that smaller kettle of only 75 gallons, it could have been used uh, at different times of the year for different purposes. And they only whaled uh, one third of the year. So two thirds of the year, they had to uh, survive off fishing, off of agriculture. And sometimes whales didn't show up at all. And that's what kind of makes them unique is that, you know, they, they were versatile individuals. They, they were able to use new technology if it came along and uh, prosper or do well for over 200 years. Um, one of the things that I I is different and kind of the environment kind of shapes how different North Carolina whalers were, you know, the, when you look at the whaling community in Carmel, they had these rock cliffs and they had, you know, and I even looked at some in Australia where you could set up um, winches and other kind of devices to bring them up on shore. Well, North Carolina got these sandy banks. You really can't, you know, you can't set it up. So they just used what was available to them and it worked for them. Um, and it did take a long time. It, it took them up to two weeks. When these whales uh, were caught by pelagic whalers out to sea, they could turn it over in a number of days. Um, it, again, it was industrialized. You had a, a large group crew of men that were working towards it, but you had the mechanics and you had different implements to do it. But there was a sense of community in North Carolina where uh, when the men are exhausted at the end of the day, they're bringing in the whale, it was the women and children that had the fire set up on the banks that brought them in. And when they got out, um, they, you know, they would have food and, and offer them some kind of, you know, um, uh, beverage, water, or something to, you know, make them feel good after the day. Because this was now going to affect the whole community. Everyone was going to be better now that the whale was brought in. Um, and everyone contributed. One of the great stories that I, after talking to one of the individuals, is that he remembers, and he took me aside and confided in me, and it was great because... People often ask, you know, did we eat whale? Did people eat whale? Because you know, we get the blubber, we get the bones, but you know, is, did anyone eat the meat? And a couple different things. I, I, I had an internship at Mystic, and this, um, one of my colleagues had found in uh, 1950 Joy of Cooking, there was a recipe for whale meat. Um, it's not something that's talked about. This individual that confided in me remembers his grandmother telling him, and it must have been, and it must have come up when they were eating pork rinds or pork cracklings because she said, she swore that nothing tasted better than whale cracklings. It beat pork cracklings every time. So I got a couple thank yous. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming in tonight. Um, East Carolina University, obviously I have a graduate student there. They've, Dr. Richards has been a tremendous help in my thesis. Um, the Graveyard of Atlantic, the Core Sound Waterfall Museum, um, the North Carolina Wildlife Center. These are places that allowed me to come in, have the talks, try to encourage individuals to come in. The North Carolina Maritime Museum in Beaufort, and then of course here at uh, CSI. Um, and my research associates, Jeremy Borelli, Allison Miller, Adam Parker, Scott Rose, and Caitlin Zant were all tremendous help in going through, working on um, getting the oral histories and taking photographs. So. Thank you. I'd like to entertain questions. Thank you, Ryan.
time for, time for questions, but I'll have to uh, run and run at you with the uh, microphone. Does anyone uh, have any questions off the bat? Did you see any evidence of whalers who lived in the Plymouth area? I, I just randomly, my dad always tells me about how our ancestors from Massachusetts came down to North Carolina and would were whalers, and then that's how the name how Plymouth got its name down here from what? Plymouth, Mass. Why didn't we sit down and go over <laughs> oral history? I mean, <laughs> I should set him up with my dad. I, I didn't. I, you know, there was a couple suggestions of different areas to look. One individual said that he remembers actually seeing two whale bones that were on the side of the road and put into the ground um, going up. And I, you know, I went to the area. I didn't find them. Um, you know, the I didn't, nothing led to me outside of that area that I kind of focalized. Um, there had been attempts further south, right around the Cape Fear region, for like one season, and then it kind of failed and fizzled and it went away. Um, again, there weren't a lot of records. There's not a lot that remains. People weren't writing it down, and if they, or if they did, it didn't make it. It didn't last. Uh, I've got a question here from uh, Corolla. Uh, in 1943, what did they use whales for? I think so, this is a reference to the fact that the boat was... So, um, the photographs from 43, um, they had the last whale, according to records, that North Carolinas were involved with taking was 1917. Um, there was, that was the last whale that we know that was taken. And there was, uh, according to records, there was actually a fire shortly after that somehow destroyed the, what was left of their craft. So, uh, that was something that interested me because if there was a fire, then maybe it burnt everything, but then they kind of left it there. So I was thinking maybe we could archeologically uncover wherever that was. I wasn't able to trace it. But um, by 1943, they weren't pursuing whales. There is a lot of uh, research that indicates that these boats weren't used strictly for whaling. Some, uh, Brimley said that these boats were specifically made for whaling. Other individuals say that they were used uh, and could be used for things like life-saving, for fishing, and for other just transportation on the sound. So um, it very well may have been in use, not for whaling, well into the 40s. So I've been um, told that the lighthouses used whale oil, right? Um, so was there a direct industry in North Carolina, you know, where the lighthouses purchasing from these North Carolina whalers? How was that transaction happening? I interesting. I mean, there's definitely a connection with the lighthouses. And one, I, w one, I was able to find out is that when they, when they got the whale, they processed it, turned into oil, they brought it to Beaufort. And Beaufort, at Beaufort, there was an auction. So the auction, if, if the oil, whoever was in charge of getting, you know, the government that gave them the okay to purchase the oil for the lighthouse compared to prices that maybe came out of New England. So it was, there was an auction. So it depended if, you know, North Carolina was willing to, you know, fetch lower because they could sell it quicker and get cash, it might have been right out of Beaufort. But it was a, um, you know, it, it, it could it depend upon the market. So, but there's an interesting connection between and correlation between Cape Lookout. A lot of the names, a lot of the individuals, for example, the whale that is hanging in Raleigh now, it was called the Mayflower uh, male, uh, whale. What was interesting about North Carolina whalers is they named their whales because it, it didn't happen that much. So they had these wonderful names for the whales that they caught. And this one was called the Mayflower, was caught uh, like May 2nd. And uh, the individual who uh, was responsible, his crew that he led, um, was also a keeper at the, at the um, Cape Lookout. So there's this kind of connection that I, I would like to explore more. Again, I, I think one of the things that helped them get things like the whaling guns and some of these new technologies is the fact that they actually got a government paycheck. So the government paycheck might have helped fund getting the new technology. There might be a connection between those two. Another online question here, uh, could you elaborate on uh, how sperm whale oil is superior to right whale oil? All right. Um, so the biggest thing, there's a couple different things. I mean, you're, you're talking about viscosity, but you're also talking about the, the ability of giving off light. So the right whale oil burned and it, it, gave, it emitted a, a just a less bright light. And it also gave off a sooty kind of smoke when compared to the sperm whale oil. The sperm whale oil is really prized for, it, 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 it gave a brighter illumination and it was also cleaner. It, it didn't, you know, especially in this time when there was tallow candles and other type variety of candles, you would have soot in your house from the candles. The sperm whale was a very, it was a very clean um, burning uh, light and it, it made these wonderful candles that were spermaceti candles also that became um, very popular in production as well. But it also, they were using lubricants. The sperm, um, sperm whales 
lubricated machines that were used in Industrial Revolution. The right whale also did, but its viscosity could last longer. It could last longer at higher temperatures, so it was valued in that way, too. Uh, can you say when was the uh, peak whaling, uh, peak of the whaling activity in this area, and uh, what what metric would you use for that? It's kind of hard to pin down. There's, you know, it, it's hard to say that um, what generally is taken as being the most uh, lucrative time period was uh, just after the Civil War, right around the 1870s. But that's also where we have the best records. So we don't, you know, we don't necessarily know, but it just that's where we have more information. So we're kind of assuming that, that that's when it was at most lucrative. But uh, estimates of, at least on record, that six whales a year. So we're talking, you know, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars um, to be split up among a variety of men in, you know, the community. Um, but th again, that's, you know, I think the records don't necessarily indicate whether or not how successful uh, these these whalers were. I, there's records during the uh, pr during the uh, colonial days that show that in p ports, even when uh, Old Inlet was open up uh, by Kerala, that that. Whale uh, was coming in. Whale oil was coming in there. Was it coming locally? We don't know. We don't have any records. We have receipts of some of these transactions, but we're kind of left to kind of not, you know, guess about some of these things. There's another online question here, a two-parter. Uh, what are some of the key differences between ship-based versus shore-based whaling, and which form was more economically successful? S one more time. Sorry, just the first part. Sorry, is my accent. Uh, what are what were some of the key differences between ship-based versus shore-based whaling, and which form was more economically successful? Okay. Well, uh, the biggest difference was that the ship was going where the whales were. If you're on shore, you're waiting for the whales. So that was, I mean, the biggest difference was that if you're in a ship, and they did, they literally went to the ends of the earth going after whales. Some of the, the most exploratory times, uncharted waters, were when whalers were heading out there right around the beginning of the 19th century. America just became a new nation, and American whalers were heading out to new areas, going to places in Australia, going to places in Japan, and they could go to where the whales were. That's what made them more lucrative. And they also, they, they kept, um, investing, reinvesting back into their industry. So you, you started getting these large um, industrial, it, uh, at one point, the island of Nantucket, the small area uh, up in New England, was one, had more millionaires per capita in the US just because the whale oil industry was that lucrative. So it was because they went to where the whales were. That's it undoubtedly made the difference between a pelagic compared to staying at shore. Staying at shore, you gotta rely on them coming to you. So that was, that was definitely the primary concern. Yeah, question. The, uh, you'd mentioned the right whale, they used the drogue to fatigue the whale, and then the sperm whale, the harpoon was attached to the, the chase boat. Yeah. Was that because of the strength and speed of the whale that just, you know, attach it to the boat so you could keep up with it, let it drag, or was do you know what the reason was? Well, there's a, there's a couple, this is even debatable too. There's a couple indications that actually British whalers were doing this back in the 17th century. So it's not necessarily a novel American idea. Um, and there's this great account where there's whalers that are, that are happening during the colonial period where, or maybe it was the 19th, early 19th century, where they actually told them, we're no longer going to use the drogue, we're going to have you guys be attached directly to the whale. At which point the crew, I think, threw all the rope overboard. There was no whaling that occurred after that. Um, it was, it, it was, it had to do with a transition in, in the industrial sense, in the sense that we're gonna, you know, this is, we need to stay with these whales. They're, they're, you're, now you're at the open ocean, um, they're moving faster, you know, you're, they're worth more. So you're, and you're invested more. And not that, they wouldn't let the, um, take the boats down. There was a guy ready with a hatchet. If it, things got too, you know, too hectic, he could hop, chop that line and, you know, be free of the whale. But it, it, be, it became because it was, you know, it, you were so invested, or at least the owners of the boat were so invested and thus conveyed to their crew how invested they were. I mean, read Moby Dick and you'll, you know, get an idea. Not, that's also a, a good point. Not to say pelagic whalers didn't employ the drogue. In fact, they did. Sometimes they came upon a pot of, of sperm whales. There were so many that they started just throwing harpoons with a drogue and then throwing after another one and just trying to get as many as they could. So it was something that didn't disappear. That's where you saw that kind of barrel-shaped one. So it was definitely something that they employed where it, it seems that North Carolina was 
those strictly. One of the things that North Carolina did boast is that n they never lost a whaleman in all their history, too, which the pelagic whalers can't say. So. Another online question. Um, whaling seems to have been more prevalent in the northern latitudes since whales migrate great distances and often breed in warm waters. Why was this? Why were they in the Arctic region? Is that what? Yeah, why were they whaling in I, north and south? And I, my understanding, and I, you know, it's interesting because it, because I, I study people as an archaeologist and I study history, there's almost this assumption that because I'm talking about whalers that I know a tremendous amount about whales. But what I do understand is that whales are going after food. They're, they're, the colder waters do have more biodiversity that these animals can feed on. And I, I think that these are the feeding grounds. That's where they can fatten up. And I mean, it, you go to where the food is. And I think, um, you know, they, they come by the coast of North Carolina, they're on their way, you know, to north to feast for the winter or the summer. Did you visit the uh, New Bedford Whaling Museum in all your studies? I did, yes I did. That's, there's a lot of stuff there. Though. There's a tremendous amount, yeah. there's a tremendous amount there. Uh, in New England, and that's what, one of the things, so I came, I had actually lived on Nantucket for, uh, for a period of time. I was there during summer work when I was an undergrad, and I fell in love with the, uh, the, you know, this crazy whaling culture where it was just, I mean, I really didn't think there was a crazier thing you could do than get in a small wooden boat and go after like these large creatures that are in the water. I mean, you're, it's just not, you know. So I, I, you know, I researched it and I got into it. And then when I came down to North Carolina, um, I came to get this maritime degree, and it was kind of, what are you interested in? You know, some, some individuals are into pirates, and some are into steamships, and so, well, I was kind of like, well, how about whaling, you know? Is, you know? So I talked to Dr. Richards, who had lived in, is from Australia, which has a, a strong whaling heritage, and he's like, well, did you know whaling occurred in North Carolina? And I had no idea. And it, that was true for a lot of individuals who are in New England. So I actually, I had an internship at Mystic Seaport. Uh, you know, I shared some of the information that I had with them up there. And it, it's, it, it's great because I, I think th this is such a unique and interesting story that contributes to America's understanding of what whaling is and you know, what America is too. I have another online question. Um, how was the whale oil distributed from the coast inland to a wider economic base? From such a geographically isolated industry, how were they able to interact with the commercial public? Okay, um, so if we're talking about shore-based compared to pelagic, there's a couple different things. But shore-based, especially in Beaufort, you know, one of the things with whale oil, especially early on, is that it's expensive. So the people who are using it are the people who have some money. So they're the people in Philadelphia, they're the people in Boston, they're the people in New York City. Benjamin Franklin professed that the sperm whale candle oil is the best candle oil to write anything ever, you know. So it was individuals who had the means to get it. Um, when you're talking about getting the goods, uh, I, I do know that, you know, especially when the, the train developed inland, the trains were obviously used to get the whale oil where it needed to go. But if you're talking about a pelagic, um, whale vessels, as far as filling up their holds, you know, they, they would stay out to sea, and sometimes up three, four, I think the longest voyage was eight years that they were out there going after whales, filling up their hold to then return to the, the ports of Boston. Um, also, in the colonial period, a lot of it went to Europe directly. So, um, in France was using it to light their streets. Um, so, as far as going into the hinterlands, it depended upon the individuals who had the means to do it. So there was some kind of already structure set up. Uh, we're talking in Philadelphia and New York City, and, and, but mainly in staves, going on boats to go into these major cities. Uh, these are great questions online. I'm using them for your thesis defense. Um, uh, there's another one here. Why did the whalers, pro uh, did the whalers process one whale at a time uh, or multiple based on what they caught. All right, so the whalers are in North Carolina whalers or uh, pelagic whalers. So we'll just start with North Carolina whalers. So you had teams, you had teams of six guys. You know, you, you, what you could get out of that whale, it, you know, it, it did, we do know it took up to two weeks. Um, and how fast they did that, it did, you know, depended upon their crew. If they're, they're exhausted, they, you know, it's high tide, it's anchored, like let's go get some sleep and, you know, worry about the whale tomorrow. But you, did, you had this community, so, you know, again, we don't have records of this. There, it seems, you know, they worked as a team. We don't know if they, you know, had something with, 
methodical, but I do know that there would be multiple whales going on at the same time. So, you know, this crew over here brought in a whale, they're working on, um, you know, uh, trying it out, and this crew is working on it and trying it out. If you wanted to join up and just say, let's just all throw it in together, I'm sure that, that was something that happened too, but now you've got to split the, you know, the profits even more. So if this team of six brought in a whale that's considerably larger than that one over there, you might have been like, well, we got this. We'll take care of this. You know, like, so I think it depends. Going online, if no one has a question. Um, was there a preferred time of year for whaling? And I'm going to add a second question. If a whale was caught at sea and brought ashore, do we know how long it would typically take to bring it ashore? Okay. So, the, I mean, we know the whaling season in North Carolina again is the spring. It's February to uh, April, at the end of April. So this is a good whale watching season off Cape Lookout. Um, as far as taking it to shore, there's a, there's a number of different factors that are at play. Um, there, you know, depending upon the size of the whale, depending on how quickly. One of the interesting things when we talk about the, the shoulder gun is that sometimes it wasn't that successful. And it, there's a couple of things that we're not really sure. Did, were, did they get wet? You know, it, there was one that the guy had, uh, one of the whalers had used seven cartridges on one whale and it still wouldn't give. So whether or not they'd get, go in and fizzle out or whether they glanced off the whale when it hit the water, there's a couple, um, there was, Generally, there, there's so, some of the epic stories, and that they're the ones that tend to survive, right? The, the story where they fought the whale all day. There's this great story in a, a Raleigh magazine from, or a newspaper from right before the uh, beginning of the 20th century, um, where they fought it all day. And, and it, there was actually this great story where uh, supposedly he lands on it and rides the whale for a little while, too. Um, but, it, you know, it could take all day, but again, the concern is for, I think, the individual. So if the sun starts dipping and you're getting away from the coast, they did rely on the families to start the fires, but it's like, if you're out to the coast and you're off Cape Lookout, you know, I, I think you, you, you kind of have to um, figure out what you're going to do. I'll just, there's another question here from Silpa. Um, is there a reason why consumption of whale meat fell out of vogue, or alternatively, why, why it never caught on, unlike in some European nations in East Asia? Yeah, it, you know, that is something that's interesting to me. I definitely find it interesting, um, for whatever reason, that it did fall out of vogue. It's not clear as to why. There is, uh, you know, these whalemen would be at sea, and one of the things, especially when it was so industrialized by, by the mid-19th century, that the whalemen ate these terrible biscuits, because they'd been out to sea for a year or longer, and they had these terrible hard tack or, or spoiled meat. And meanwhile, every, you know, every couple of weeks, they had this fresh source of meat, but they weren't eating it. There is some connotation that it was, it was, uh, you know, something for the lesser sect or it was for individuals who were not civilized. There was this kind of connotation that s being civilized meant not eating whale meat. Um, but there's also indications that definitely whalemen at definitely had to, uh, at times enjoyed it. One of the um, on pelagic vessels, one of the, to celebrate um, catching a whale or maybe even filling your hold was to actually make donuts in the whale oil. So they would put some kind of batter into the oil while it's, blubbering, while it's boiling and then eat that and it was just, I, 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 it's, I guess it was, you know, pretty wonderful, so. Mm, tasty. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned this uh, about this sort of connotation of being, whale meat being lesser. And we know in other nations that there was often relationships, you know, between uh, indigenous people um, based on this perception that whale meat wasn't fit for a civilized, um, uh, consumption, you know, places like Australia, New Zealand, etc. But um, in those nations, we have a lot of in situ um, archaeological heritage, and your study was an ex situ, is an ex situ study. Why why can't we do in situ studies uh, in North Carolina, or wh where where have they been? Uh, have there been in situ um, archaeological finds on the East Coast? So on the East Coast or North Carolina? Well, let's, let's do North Carolina. So in North Carolina, there ha they haven't found any, we haven't been able to uncover anything that was directly linked to whaling in North Carolina. The UAB, the Underwater Archaeological Branch of North Carolina, did find a vessel which they thought might be a, one of those um, early vessels that one of the Provincetown whalers, and that was found in, in Cape Lookout. And it was just the hull. Um, it kind of fit with the characteristics of what they thought one of these small Provincetown whalers were, which were only about 80 feet. They weren't very long, they weren't very big, they were schooners, and um, it wasn't definitively um, said that, that, they had, that that's what it was. 
the, the, that one particular shipwreck was actually documented. It, it, it had um, basically got blown up. Way, the, the tide had come up high and it got blown up on shore, effectively beaching it. And then the winds had stripped it and um, whatever the outer bankers could get, I think they helped their part too. But the, there is the UAB believes that the remains of the hull of uh, a whaler is there. But that is, again, the pelagic whaler. As far as North Carolina, there was a study uh, a woman did in 2000 in, I want to say, seven, um, Emily Jataf. And she looked for remnants of Diamond City, which is, again, on Shackleford Banks. There was a settlement. They believe up to at one point there was 500 inhabitants that lived there that were closely connected to whaling. But also with that hurricane, the, there was a series of hurricanes that came through. And it, 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 it was enough to you know, make the individuals be like, you know, let's, let's pack it up and let's go inland a little bit. But they didn't quit. There was, there's definitely individuals that lived in Moorhead and still would move to the Outer Banks during the season and go after whales. But they, they, they were transportable. They brought their things with them and then they took them back. So there, wasn't any, there doesn't appear to be any remains. It doesn't mean that there isn't any, though. Any other questions from the audience? Well, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate your uh, talk tonight. It was great. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, next month on May 6, we have uh, another talk. Franklin Price, who currently works for the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Resort Research, is uh, going to be coming and talking about uh, his, ti his ti the title of his talk is More Than Meets the Eye Artifacts from the Sediments of the Wreck of the Queen Anne's Revenge. So uh, that's uh, Thursday in a, a month's time. Uh, otherwise, thank you everyone for coming. I hope to see you next month.